So I want to go ahead and introduce uh, all of the, the, the panelists today. We have Tracy Kirkley, as I already mentioned, uh, who is an agent here in DeSoto County. We have Brian Walters, who's with us, who I do not see on the Zoom at this moment, but I know Brian is here. And he's a mortgage loan officer here in DeSoto County. And we also have Keith Townsend, who is an agent as well in DeSoto County. And then we have Macy Carney, who is with Mississippi Home Corp. Each of them will be speaking on topics and I will go ahead and cover those as well. Um, I should have covered those immediately. Tracy's gonna talk about the first home buyer in our first, home, in our first segment. And then uh, Brian is gonna speak on getting pre-qualified and loans and, how, and the process of all of that. And then Macy's gonna speak on grants and down payments. With that in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and talk, turn it over to Brian, who will get us started with the mortgage loan process. Can't hear him. Am I good? There we go, there he is. My first Zoom call, so bear with me here. So guys, I'm Brian Walters, um, Eagle Bank Mortgage, been in the business uh, uh, 20, this is my 25th year, so I've, I've, I've seen a thing or two, I feel like. Um, uh, and I think the, the, the question, the reason I was brought to the panel was talk about pre-qualification or, or the mortgage process in general. Um, there are basically four primary loans out there we do, and then there's several, what we call, I call them sub-loans. Um, and that's probably something Macy's going to talk more about later on, some of the uh, first-time home buyer programs, things like that. Um, in general, there's, there's basically FHA, uh, VA, uh, USDA, and, and then a conventional loan. And all of those have got different restrictions, uh, different guidelines, um, different credit requirements, uh, different what's called debt-to-income ratios. Um, and and this, if, I, if I touch each one of those, this would go to a, a probably a four-hour long uh, call. So I won't, I won't touch on all of that. But in the end, the first thing we do when I meet with a client um, is I ask them what their needs are. What are they trying to accomplish? And uh, for example, are they trying to um, buy a home with as little money down as possible? Or do they have some money they're going to try to put down? You know, they're, they're, are they selling a house and got some equity from that house? They're going to put it down? Um, or what are their needs? Um, next, we'll talk about their, their uh, uh, credit score, their credit. Um, is, is there anything they do with the credit uh, as far as improving the score? Or is it, is it good to go? Uh, and then third, we'll talk about their, their income and their debt. Um, and based off of each one of those factors, we'll decide what loan fits them best. Um, for example, an FHA loan is one that requires a, a three and a half percent down payment where a USDA or a VA loan requires no money down. Um, conventional financing could be as little as 3%, but it's probably more designed for somebody who's gonna put five to 10 or 20% down. Um, so that's usually the, the first first question we're gonna have is what do you wanna put down? And then like I said from there, the, the credit scores and, and debt ratios will go next. So. Um, Sonny, is there anything specific that you want me to, to, to touch on or to address or just, just to kind of break down each one of those loans for them? Yes, I think that would be a great idea to break down the loans and how to pre-qualify and the actual process as you go through. And we're yeah. going to pause for just a moment, Brian, if that's okay with you. Sure. And, and move to Keith for a moment because you mentioned credit scores and that's really important. And I'm gonna, Keith is actually speaking on that topic. So if you don't yeah. mind us taking that segue into the credit segment segment with Keith and let him talk about that first. And then we'll come back to you with the yeah. actual process. Keith, and we'll turn it over to you. All right, there we go. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah, there you are. All right. The thing about credit is most lender will easily get you approved with a 620 or higher. But in most cases, uh, a lot of buyers or soon-to-be buyer would not meet their criteria. And one of the things that uh, I like for them to focus on is that it's okay to have bad credit. It's not okay to have bad credit and not do nothing about it. So sometimes you have to do some work with your credit to get it where it needs to be. And some good resources out there, uh, one of the first places you want to stop and take a look at is annualcreditreport.com. They will give you uh, all three of your credit reports absolutely free. 
And with that, you can start looking and seeing what's on there that needs to be repaired, what's on there need to be corrected, and what's on there that you can do yourself before you reach out to a credit repair service or anything like that. A lot of things on there can be corrected by yourself. I mean, you don't need to pay no one to do it or anything like that. And the more money you save, the more money you can use to go towards your down payment and other things to help you uh, become a homeowner. Now, uh, once you get your scores from the, uh, well, you have to pay for the score, but you get your reports free. Once you start seeing a discrepancy on there, things that you need to dispute or get off your credit report, then those are the things that you want to write letters and let them know what's going on and everything like that. One of the, the main focus of all levy is on the credit report. All your credit uh, reporting should be the same. All three of them should be the same. Uh, most of the time, a lot of them will vary. They vary because they get inaccurate information and information is not correct. And that's where you'll come in and dispute that information to have them correct it. Now, the more you do on your own before you reach out to a lender, the better off you will be because now you're putting yourself in a position to qualify and to get your score where you need to be. Now, uh, a lot of lenders will assist you and help you and show you direction and where you need to go. Uh, most time you go to the lender, I know some of you probably encountered, uh, they might say you don't qualify yet. But before you walk out that lender office, ask them, well, what do I need to have removed or what do I need to correct in order for me to qualify? Most of them will give you a general idea of what's need to be removed, uh, what are some of the things that you cannot go forward with, uh, like the, uh, how, uh, mostly if you have a 2000 collection on there, then you have to have that all before you're able to buy a home. So they'll, they'll give you a snippet of information like that, but you have to ask them and let them know why you don't qualify. And once, they, once you get that information, now you have a game plan that you can move forward with on what you need to work with and what you need to get off your credit, okay? Turn it back over to you, Sonny. Is there anything else? Thank you, Keith. And you mentioned, could you mention that um, website one more time that you mentioned earlier on where they should go to to look at their credit report? And your credit report .com. Uh You can get all three of them from Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. You get them free. Uh, you get one uh, one free each uh, each year. Now, if you just need a general idea, you can stag them and get one every three months, and that way you have a general idea of what your credit would be throughout the year, or you can get all three of them at once, and then next year you have to wait to get the next one. So you, they will give them to you free once a year. Thank you so much. And it's really important too for everyone to know that when something on a specific day, that that is reported as well, correct? Is something on a specific day? If it was paid on time or not. Oh, uh, it's very important because mm -hmm. uh, missing a payment or not Like it paying, reports on monthly payments and things. Right, if you're not paying a payment can drop your credit score about 20 to 30 points and that's by missing about one day. So you definitely want to make your payments on time. That's a big part of your credit. And that, that's a big part of the criteria they use to uh, measure your credit as well. So you want to make sure you pay them on time, pay your bills on time. Are there any other examples that you would like to share that's on a credit report, Keith? Uh, most would time, I be you, reflected in a report? Uh, most of the time you have a different amounts that are being reflected on your credit report. Just say like you have a Capital One card. Uh, the amount on the Capital One card may be incorrect. Uh, TransUnion might say you owe 400 bucks. Uh, Equifax might say you owe 600 bucks. Uh, the thing is, since all the information is coming from one source, all the information should be the same across the board. And that's what you want to dispute and make sure all of it is corrected. Make sure they report all of it as accurate as possible because uh, your debt to income ratio pay a big part of it. And believe it or not, 90% of all credit uh, reports have mistakes on them. And that will be your, your major key to go in there and correct the information that's inaccurate on there. And that will help you out a lot, especially when you just a few points uh, most of my clients be in the 600. They just need a few points. By going in and making any correction, disputing these uh, items, they're able to achieve those few points in a credit score. So it, it's worth it to go take a look at your credit report, know what's on there, correct if it's inaccurate, and move forward. Thank you, Keith. And just to recap from what you're saying, it's really important for someone to check their credit, make sure they look at all three bureaus to ensure that they are correct. And if not, reach out to someone to get those corrected as quickly as possible. And then just to maintain any structured payments on, on a monthly basis or whatever that they're called the repayment structure to be, to make sure that you meet those timelines. 
Anything else that you would like to add before we move to Brian? Uh, credit is very different for each person, different situation. And I mean, each situation is totally different each person. Uh, so most of them is really detailed to what's on that person uh, credit report. And like most time that we have to take a look or you have to take a look at your credit report and see what situation it needs to be applied to. Uh, one of the biggest things we see are student loans and uh, student loans, uh, a lot of people say they can't be removed, but they can be corrected. And uh, they can be corrected, and uh, you want to make sure that that information is accurate. Um, one of the biggest things I see with student loan is reporting inaccurate amount. So that would be a big help to you just as well. Thank you, Keith. And that website, one more time. Uh, www.annualcreditreport.com. I just typed in a, a chat box for everyone. And like I said, they give you one free report a year. You can stack them out. Uh, one every three months or once every four months, or you can get all of them at one. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. And Brian, we'll, we'll move back to you now on the mortgage loan process. And now that we understand what the importance of a credit report and the scoring, um, please talk to us about the first steps when someone is getting ready to actually uh, get qualified for a loan. Okay, let me let me touch on one thing Keith said too to kind of fo to follow up with that that point there. Um, probably the most common phone call I get, and I get it several times a day, is from a client that, or from a potential client that says I've been on uh, online and I see my credit karma score. Um, guys, there's different versions of scores out there based off of who's pulling the report. It's geared toward the industry that's pulling the report. Uh, for example, a mortgage lender may see one score, a car dealership can see another score, uh, a credit card company can see another score. There's different versions out there. So um, the, the whole credit card uh, theory, typically it's higher than what we're going to see on a mortgage score, not always. Um, but I tell folks all the time, it gives you a good idea where you are. But if you're, if you're interested in buying a home, until you've had a mortgage lender pull it, um, you're probably going to get the actual true mortgage score. Like Keith was saying, there's websites out there, you can find some that give you some kind of a general idea. Um, so don't be surprised if a mortgage lender pulls it and uh, it's 20 points different than what you've seen when you pulled your own, because that does happen uh, more often than you can imagine. So, um, uh, and then I think it's funny, the, the, the process there. Um, what we generally do is we'll send a, a bar, bar to our website or they'll come to the office in person. Um, we'll sit down and fill the application out. Uh, probably the vast majority nowadays want to go online, um, probably more due to the, the virus than anything, but um, they go online for the application out where they come in, fill it out. Uh, first thing we'll do is pull the credit report, um, see what the score is. Uh, next thing we'll do is we'll reach out and give them a list of documents we need to see. It's usually going to be things like um, most recent paycheck stuff, uh, probably the last couple of years, W-2s or tax returns. Uh, maybe bank statements, some of the kind of loan we're doing, but we'll, we'll, we'll gather all the information. It's like a puzzle. We'll put it together. And then, um, you know, I touched on it earlier, we're going to ask them what their desires are, their needs, or what their, their wants are. And we're going to put that into the equation and we're going to figure out uh, what loan fits them best. And then from there, we're going to uh, reach back out to them and, and give them all the details. Now, at this point in the game, if you don't have a property yet uh, that you're looking to buy, you're not locking an interest rate in yet. You're simply getting a, a pre-qualification or a pre-approval, depending on what, what step you take there. But um, you're getting what I call a game plan together. Uh, then once the game plan is, is, is set in, in motion, you get with your realtor, you find the house, you write the contract, and then we can talk about locking in interest rates um, at that point. Uh, but uh, first thing first, we get you pre-qualified. Uh, then you get with your realtor and, and you go find the house. Um, and then once you found that house, and you've negotiated your contract, which I'm sure we'll touch on later on, um, that's when the lender gets back involved again. So we're, we're, in, we're very hands-on in the beginning, and then uh, things get a little quiet as you get with your realtor and, and, and shop for your home, and then we're back involved in the process again once you found that home. Thank you, Brian. Hi, Keith. Hey. <laughs> I think I lost Brian. <laughs> so Brian, in regards to um, once that you've gone through that whole process and you're 
correct in saying that more and more people are doing all of their business online simply because of the pandemic that we have experienced those great challenges this year with that. And so uh, I know that 50% of all people who have done their online banking say that they will continue to do so. So with that in mind, um, tell us a little bit about the expectation of how they get those documents to you. Do they, can they hand those off in person to you or can they send those to you um, through email? Yeah, a little everything. Um, uh, we have the folks who take a picture of it from their phone and send it in. And of course, we, all, we usually cringe then because the, it's not very legible, but we try to make it legible. Uh, email works great. Um, folks still come in the office every day. Uh, so, so, you know, whatever fits best, we make it happen. Um, it's all the same. So tell us once you get into the process and they have been uh, pre-qualified or qualified. Talk to us about how, what the process is online now as opposed to how it used to be either via telephone or in an office somewhere. What should they expect to receive from you um, through email? Yeah, I, I'm still old school. I like to sit down and, and have a face-to-face -face conversation just because I feel like the bar gets more out of it. Um, when I mm -hmm. the phone or, or email, uh, there's such a, 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 a gap there of communication that just doesn't get through. When somebody's sitting down face-to-face, -face, they can usually, if, if they don't understand, I can see it in their eyes, and, and I'll make sure they understand. Um, uh, so, yeah, if, if, if every bar is different. Like I said, I would, if I had to throw a number at it, I would say 95% of my clients nowadays never set foot in the office. Um, where I've done this for 25 years, at one time, 100% came to the office and we did it face to face. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's been a, a big. Um, uh, but yeah, if, if the board wants to come in, sit down, and do it in person, I, I'm absolutely welcome to that. Um, I think they get more out of it that way. Yeah, but it depends on the, that board's level of understanding. Some, this is their second, third, fourth, fifth house. They, I'm simply just an order taker at that point. Um, some is the house, and I'm an advisor then. So it depends on that person's level of comfort. Thank you for that, Brian. And do we have any questions at this point, Amanda? No questions right now. No questions? No. Okay. All right. Brian, is there anything else that you would like to add to the process? No, I think I'm going to listen and I'll chime in as needed. Okay. All right. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Macy Carney um, from Mississippi Home Corps, who is going to speak to us about grant first uh, down payment assistance. Good evening. Or down payment assistance. I should say. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Macy with Mississippi Home Corporation. And just to give you a short history lesson, if you're not familiar with Mississippi Home Corp, we are the state's housing finance agency. So what that means is anything to do with affordable housing within Mississippi, we have a hand in. So tonight I'm talking to you about down payment assistance programs um, for home buyers, whether you're a first time or not. Um, but we also have different programs. We actually have one in place and we'll be adding more money to it, which is our ramp program, which is rental assistance for Mississippians. That program came out because of COVID. Um, so if you know anybody that is in need of help for rental assistance, please send them, you can send them to me and I can send them the link, but we have a website, it's ms-ramp.com. Um, and then we also have other programs that assist with multifamily housing, which would be your, um, your apartment complexes and things like that. So. Just a brief little lesson, um, but we do have a couple of programs for home buyers. Again, some require you to be a first time home buyer, some do not. Um, one in particular that requires you to be a first time home buyer is our mortgage revenue bond program. You'll probably see it more in the form of MRB7. Um, so that's mortgage revenue bond. The seven is gonna be the down payment that you get. So you would get $7,000 towards your down payment. And so what that means is, we're giving you that $7,000. It can go towards your down payment and it can also be split if needed um, towards your closing cost. So that can help both of those things. And let me also say, we don't have any grants per se. Um, a grant would mean we give you the money, you never pay it back ever. Um, and so with the bond program, the $7,000 you get, you would, the, the catch, I guess you'd want to say, is that you, if you live in the house for 10 years, you would never owe that money back. But if you were to sell the house 
or refinance it before that 10 years, you would be required to pay that $7,000 back. So probably what you're hearing is, holy moly, that's a lot of time. And if I don't fulfill it, then I got to pay this money back. So let me soften that blow by saying, I work with all of the lenders throughout the state. I always ask them the question, what are people saying about this program? Are they scared to do it? And nine times out of 10, they love it. The borrower loves it because at the end of the day, it's helping you get into that home. And the cool thing about it is if life happens and you do have to move or refinance or something like that, specifically moving, buying a house is an investment. So you hope to make a gain on that sale. When you make a gain on that sale, you can use that gain, part of it, to pay off that 7000 So it doesn't have to be as scary as it sounds. Um, to qualify for that program, again, first-time home buyer or someone who has not owned a home in three years. Um, Mississippi Home Corporation does not have a credit score minimum, but Brian, I'm talking, coming to you. The lender does have a certain uh, credit score minimum that they do have to follow on their end. So check with your lender on that. Uh, and then the income is based on county. We have a list of that on our website. You can look at it for one to two people in a household and three or more in the household. Again, it all depends on what county you purchase in. Um, again, that's something that your lender, this is a huge joke, but I'm sure if you haven't heard it, here it is. Um, the lender will know everything but your blood type. So <laughs> they're gonna know everything about it and they're gonna help you figure out which program is best for you. So. Um, Tracy, I think we have someone who may have a question. Okay. And I believe they're asking how to ask the question. You can ask the question in chat. Okay. So if someone wants to pop that question in there, um, Amanda will grab that for us and, and let us know when it's available. Okay. So I'll just wait on Amanda then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the next program is called Smart Solution. It, it, it actually does not require you to be a first time home buyer. So if we have anyone that's on the call that is maybe wanting to move to a different location or just wanting to, to get a bigger house or smaller house, if you currently own a home, we're not looking at that, which is great. So this program will give you a three and a half percent down payment. And that three and a half percent is based on the loan amount. So for simple math, if you've got a hundred thousand dollar loan, this program will give you $3,500 towards your down payment. Again, it can also be used for your closing costs. Um, that that $3,500 or the, the three and a half percent that you receive, um, is in the form of a second mortgage. So what you'll have is that big 30 year loan, that's your $100,000. And then you'll also have a smaller loan, it's only for 10 years, and it's only for that $3,500 or whatever amount yours ends up being based on the loan amount. So once that 10 years is paid off, you're done with that, you just stick with the big payment over here. Again, I actually was talking with a lady uh, yesterday who was a first time home buyer. We were kind of walking through her options and it kind of freaked her out at first because she kept thinking, I'm just going to have two payments and that's a lot. I will tell you my own personal story. I did not use this specific program, but I did use a program similar to it back eight years ago. And I have a second mortgage. Thankfully, I've almost, almost paid it off, but it's only $40 extra a month. Again, everybody's math is going to be different, but this is again something that you can have a conversation with with your lender and say, hey, I like both of these programs. I can actually get a qualified for both of these programs. Which one would be better for me? And the great thing about them knowing everything about you is they will help you make the best educated decision for that. So to qualify for that program, you don't have to be a first time home buyer. You do have to have a minimum credit score of 640. And then the household income for the entire state, no matter where you live, is $95,000. So that's, and those, those, that 95,000 actually changed a few years ago and they, we increased it. So I'm pretty excited about that. I'm sure there's many that are very excited about that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I've got two more quick little things. Shut me up if you need me to. No, you keep going. Um, the, one of our other down payment assistance programs is very specific to a certain group of folks and as teachers. So I always like to mention this because we all know teachers. We have had teachers, we may live with teachers. I lived with one for forever. My mom was a teacher. Um, so we have a housing assistance for teachers program. 
it gives that uh, teacher up to $6,000 towards the purchase of their home. The cool thing about it is there's no income limit. So if their spouse is making a nice living that may be over the income that we have, the highest income is 95,000 with Smart Solution. Um, if they're over that income, they could still qualify because we're not looking at that income. Um, so I just wanted to quickly touch on that. It's a great program. We have certain um, school districts listed on our website. Unfortunately, it's not statewide. There are certain school districts that the Department of Education deems uh, uh, short critical shortage areas and they want teachers in there. So we have to look at those school districts specifically. Um, and again, all of this information is on our website. I'll give that at the end. And then the last program is not a down payment program, but it is a fantastic benefit for borrowers, specific to first time buyers. Um, and it, it's kind of a hard one to wrap your head around, so hopefully I'll do a good job of explaining it. And that's our mortgage credit certificate, short for MCC. So the mortgage credit certificate, I'm gonna take a step out of it real quick. Everybody here is interest rate, interest rate, interest rate. I'll pay interest, what's my interest gonna be? So this program, when you don't have that program, like I don't have this program, um, I'm deducting 100% of my interest that I've paid annually at tax time. So I don't, I just get to deduct it, that's it. The mortgage credit certificate allows you to actually get 40% of that money back into your pocket. So it does cap it at 2,000, but if you think about it, just for owning a home, living in that home and paying interest, as long as you live in the house and have interest that you're paying on it, then you will get up to $2,000 as a refund. And it can come at tax time or you can take that refund. Um, you'll have to talk to your uh, employer, but you can actually get that money monthly and have that added into your bank account. Um, so just a quick little synopsis of that program. Like I said, I try to make it as easy as possible because it's a hard one to figure out because you're working with interest and numbers and all that. Um, that one, you do have to be a first time home buyer. And it's actually the same guidelines as from the first program that I talked about, the MRB7. They kind of run parallel to each other. Um, so those are our programs. I will want to touch on one thing. And a lot of people, the next question I get is, well, how do I get this money? How do I apply? The great thing about it is all you do is go to Brian Walters <laughs> and you say, hey, I want these programs. And he does all of the work for you. You just have to read a couple of documents and sign your name about a million times. Um, and then you, they will do all of the work for you. They'll contact us on your behalf. So you don't have to do anything um, except talk to your lender about this program. And we do have a list of participating lenders on our website. Again, all of this is just everything's on the website. It's super easy to find. Um, and then one last thing is to qualify and use any of our programs, you do have to use, uh, excuse me, go through a home buyer education course. There's a lot of them online. Several of them are free. Um, they used to offer classes in person, and I think that's kind of gone to the wayside because of COVID. But it's super easy. If you have like an hour and you want to do it for free, you can get it done in an hour through some of the websites. But you do have to do that and that's a certificate that you would give to your lender to say hey I did this and it's just a great resource because you can learn all about the housing stuff I mean I didn't know what the heck an escrow was eight years ago so it's great to kind of learn those things um, so I'll, I'll shut up now appreciate you guys listening to me are there any questions uh, there uh, are some questions. Sorry, Macy, we actually had a question. Um, I'm not sure if you or Brian would be the best one to answer this, but it is about your um, teacher program. They asked, what is the credit score for the count, uh, down payment program for the teachers? So the HAT program, it does not have a, we don't have a specific credit score for that program. There's not a minimum. Again, it, I'm going to ding it back to Brian. Um, you would have to have their approval. They have their own minimum credit score that they'd have to follow on that. Yeah, so it is based off the the, the lender and the, and the investors buying the loan, but in most cases it's going to be a 640 nowadays. Um, before COVID, we had some options at 600, uh, but when, when the virus hit, several things tightened up and, and most loans went to that 640 parameter in, in, in nowadays. Perfect. 
Uh, we've had another question in the chat. This one will actually go to Brian as well. Um, it says, it has a question about how does child support affect your approval process for credit? So my answer is probably the same with every question you ask. It, it comes down to the type of loan you're doing. Um, uh, if you have child support and it's current, we just count it as a debt, and what's called the debt to income ratio. I think I saw the question and it mentioned uh, uh, arrears. Uh, that could be a whole different situation. Um, if, it's in, if it's in arrears and there's a, a payment plan set up and you've been paying back the arrearage um, and we've got a history of that, and we just count it as a debt and move forward usually. Um, if there's a, there are some cases where there's a, a past due balance on the credit report in a collection account um, and you haven't been paying it back, well, in some cases, some loans require us to count 5% of that balance as a projected payment. So um, in the mortgage world, nothing's really, very few things are black and white. It's a lot of, uh, a lot of gray area and it depends on the kind of loan you're doing and, and all the parameters go with it. But uh, um, so the answer could be anywhere from we just count the debt and move forward to we count 5% of the debt and move forward. Um, if your debt ratio can absorb that and you qualify with it, then it's usually not a problem. Um, we're not going to make you go pay it off. Uh, that's, that's never the case. Um, but it may be a case where we can't just ignore it either. So we're going to count it somewhere in the equation. Okay. We have a couple of more questions. Um, one what is for you, Macy. It asks, uh, is there a link on y'all's website for the... Uh, fire education program? program. Yes, there is, and I actually just um, copied and pasted it into the chat box. Perfect. All right, we have another question. Um, Macy, again, with your programs, if I haven't owned a home in a long time, is there a time limit for me being a first-time home buyer again or qualifying for those? Yeah, so as long as you have not owned a property for three or more years, specific, the three, the three years is just the big number, but as long as you haven't owned a home in three years, uh, or property, then you would be qualified as a first-time buyer. Perfect. I think that's all we have right now for questions. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Macy. Those are all great questions. And now, that's a great segue um, to move towards Tracy Kirkley, who is an agent in the Soto County, and she's going to talk about first-time home buyers. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, so glad to be here today. And uh, it sounds like those, those of you who are on the call are probably first time home buyers. And I'm going to take out one of my earpieces. Sorry. Um, when I hear myself in stereo, it kind of freaks me out. But uh, so first time home buying, exciting time. I mean, y'all are all ramped up and it's, you're going out on your own and you're, you're going to buy your first super big purchase. And so it's, it's an exciting time. And what I would just like to throw out to you is just there, there's a process to go through for this that can, can kind of help you make sure that you, you hit the steps that you need to to get you from here to exactly where you want to be. It's kind of like anything in life. You kind of put together the game plan. And so the game plan that, uh, that I and, and I know uh, Keith and the other agents in our market, uh, basically we put together for, for the first time home buyers and really for any home buyers is we, number one, you're going to need an agent, okay? And, and a real estate agent for um, a buyer, basically they're, they're working in your interests and they're helping you with not just the search process, but also the process all the way through and helping to guide you from figuring out what it is that you're looking for all the way to getting to the closing table, okay? And so, that's going to involve several different steps and you just want to make sure that you're you're connected with a great agent who who knows the process and has been around to to understand how you get from point a all the way to point z okay because there there are several steps involved there so um they're gonna if you don't already have a lender they can help you find a good lender and um and certainly you know we've got great ones already on on this zoom call but um, you know, they can help connect you with a good lender. And I'm just gonna throw out to you something to consider uh, heavily and to discuss with your real estate agent. And when you're choosing your lender, um, looking locally first, okay? Looking at good local lenders. And the biggest reason for that 
is, and we're going to actually talk about this a little bit more in depth uh, in, in a little bit with regard to making offers in our current climate, um, because it's it's a it's a different climate right now for for home buyers, and especially right now for the first time home buyers. And when you're making those offers, having a good, strong local lender behind you and backing you and saying, hey, you're good and you're good to go on the purchase, that's going to be a super, super important piece of the puzzle for you. Okay. And so once you've found your agent and you have found your lender and, and the lender has said, okay, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, you know, you can qualify for X number of dollars of purchase price. Okay, then you determine, okay, do I want to go all the way to the top of that purchase price? Just because you're qualified for 200,000, understand you don't have to spend 200,000. You need to also help and, and discuss with your lender. You know, I also would also just like for my payment to be at such and such. And so what does that, where does that put me? So that then you can talk with your agent so that together with that number, and along with your list of wants and needs, all right, your agent is going to discuss with you and ahead of time, you and whoever's buying the house with you, if it's, if there's somebody else involved or just yourself, um, you're going to put together a, man, this is everything that I would love to have in my first home. Okay. You're going to start with the big list. Okay. And then you and your agent are going to together are going to kind of help pare that down to what are the true, this is what I must have. This is what I'd like to have. These are the areas that I'd like to live in and maybe rank those. Gosh, I'd like to be in this area. This is my top area. Then maybe this area. And gosh, I absolutely have to have a fenced backyard because I have a dog. Okay. Well, what if, and so these are things your agent will help you think about. Okay. Is that an absolute or what if you were able to get a good enough deal on a house that didn't have a fence that you could put a fence in? You know, so your agent's going to help walk you through those things as well. So, so we've got the agent. Now we've got the lender. We know how much money we can spend. You and the agent have discussed what do I have to have? What would I like to have? And then together you start the fun part. Okay. You get to go ahead and start searching for homes and you'll start that process online typically. And you are probably already online looking at some of those websites right now before you've even found the agent, before you found your lender. And that's totally cool because it's helping to kind of gear you towards what the market looks like. All right. Once you have started that, you and your agent will start doing that together. And they'll kind of help school you a little bit on some of the sites, some of the sites that might be better than others, some of the sites that might not be as great as others. Um, and helping you to really find the right house. Because there are, there are some sites that don't have all the houses on them. There are some sites that don't have uh, as much information and I'm not gonna go into what those sites are because I certainly, since this is being recorded, I would not want to be sued by any of those sites. But you and your agent can certainly discuss that. Once you've kind of started looking at some stuff online, you and your agent will start searching for homes Okay, which means you'll actually start going out to the homes, doing some site visits, going on showings. Okay, I'm not going to get into all of the in-depth on each one of these. I just want you to kind of know what the whole process entails. So you're going to go on the showings and then you're going to find the house that you go, oh my gosh, this is the house that we'd really like to, to, we can see our family in, we can see ourselves in, this is what I want for my first house. Then you and the agent will sit down, you'll look at the pros and cons, You'll look at um, what other homes like that maybe have sold for so that you can go ahead and put together a good offer. Your agent will help guide you with regard to that. What might be a good offer? What might not be a good offer? What's going to help you get again from point A to point Z? All right. They are going to um, help you with the offer form. There are forms involved, you know, like anything, you know, somebody mentioned earlier, sign in, sign in, sign in, you know, there's going to be a lot of signing starting at this point. And then also when you get to Brian, Brian's going to have a lot of things for you to sign. And then you're going to get to the closing table and there's going to be a lot of things to sign, but it's going to start with the offer and the paperwork that the real estate agent's going to have for you. And they will guide you through that process. The agent will present the offer to the other, to the listing agent. And the negotiations start, that can happen quickly. That can also take sometimes a few days. Okay, so just keep in mind the end game. 
when you're doing the negotiations and your agent will help you keep on track with that, I'm sure. But you just try not to get uh, tied up into the little things, but look at the end game of what you're trying to accomplish. All right, so now you've made it through negotiations and you've got a contract on the house. At that point, it gets back to the lender because the contract will go there. They will start all of the loan processing. There will be an appraiser involved, okay, that will help determine the market value of the house and if that matches with what the contract says, okay. There will be a home inspection involved. There will be home insurance involved. So there's other people that are gonna be working with you throughout the process. There will be a closing attorney or an escrow uh, title company involved. And again, your real estate agent, they're gonna actually be the hub of all of this activity, okay? They're gonna be kind of right here in the middle. They're gonna be reaching out to the lender. They're gonna be reaching out to the closing attorney. They're gonna know when the appraisal's happening. They're gonna help you schedule a home inspection. They're gonna um, let you know that you need to get homeowner's insurance. Of course, your lender's also gonna tell you that. So they're gonna help walk you through all of those things, but, so just know that you're not on your own with this, okay? That, that's why the agent is so important. It's not just about, hey, I found a house. It's about, hey, walk me through from here all the way, all the way to, the, to the end game. So the last thing, once you've got all those things going, let's make sure, let's make sure everything's gone smooth. You're going to go to the closing table and everybody goes, closing, closing, what's closing? All right, that's just where you finish up the deal and you're going to sit down with your agent and sometimes your lender and um, the closing attorney or the closing officer and you sign the documents that the lender has prepared so that it will become your house and then guess what then Keith or somebody like Keith gets to hand you some keys okay and then then you're then you get to move in so that's 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 all the fun part this home search is really the really fun part but that's kind of the process from start to finish and why you need to have really good connections with the different the different people involved there. So anyway, I know we'll get a little bit more in depth on some of those things. Uh, I know Keith will, will be commenting on some of this and, and some others as well. But Sonny, is that what I was supposed to talk about? I hope so, because that's kind of <laughs> what I did. It is, and I was just checking the questions real quickly. And uh, all that you talked about, especially on negotiating, and I know there's a lot of information in regards to negotiating as well, especially in today's market with the market being so tight. So if Keith, if you could touch on that just a little bit and tell us a little bit about the market. Can you hear me? All right. We got you, there you are. As you may know, uh, DeSoto County is one of the fastest growing county in Mississippi. And I mean, it is the hot spot for everyone. And the thing is, everyone decided to come at the same time. <laughs> but the great thing is, is that we are making great progress in DeSoto County. But with that progress come a little home rules and a lot more trouble on the back end. And the thing is that we are experiencing what you may call a housing shortage. And with that, uh, you have a lot of houses that's going into multiple offers. Uh, it's not enough inventory to go around. So, uh, you really have to come really prepared if you really want to buy a house in DeSoto County. And I mean, you have to bring your A game. What I mean by that, you have to be pre-qualified. You have to have some money saved up and you have to be willing to stick it out. Uh, coming here and just thinking you just gonna find your dream home, is tough. And when I tell you it's tough, it's tough. But you have great agents in this county all of them working hard for you and they are doing everything they can to secure homes for buyers who want to move this area now again as a buyer you do have to do something on your head on your on your behalf get pre-qualified save as much money as you possibly can understand that you are not the only one they're going to be bidding on this house so you have to go through three or four months of office situation you just got to hang in there and tough it out and the thing is they build new houses but <laughs> Every time they be one, we need four more. So it, it's a tough market, but it's a great place to live. And you know that because that's why everyone is moving here. So you're going to have to dig your, your feet in. You're going to have to put in the work. And you have to uh, learn the much you possibly can about the market to understand it. And when they say monthly offer, uh, they mean that more than one person have put an offer in on their home. 
uh, the seller is the person who decide who they want to sell the house to. And normally they go with the deal that's most attracted to them. So a lot of houses are going over asking price. A lot of houses are going with no closing. And I mean, to me, that's a, whew, that's a hard one to swallow, but that's what the market dictates and that's what we have to go with. Uh, but other than that, you just have to, the, the major thing is to get pre-qualified. And that's the major thing. And everything else, you, you kind of can negotiate and work through it. But again, with the market being the way it is, a lot of sellers are backing away from paying closing costs. And that's why I tell you, you have to have some money saved, if not a lot, at least something, or tap into the Mississippi Home Court, get some down payment assistance program, put that on your team, and they can always help out. But other than that, come on to DeSoto County. We love to have you. <laughs> and it is going quickly, right? Yes. It's going really quickly. And so if you're a seller, it's, it's, it's really a quick process as well, right? Yes. Uh, the, the sellers, I mean, it's their season. The sellers, I mean, they getting their dream come true. So, but a lot of sellers put houses on market within one or two hours. They have three or four contracts. And I mean, it's the most amazing thing that I've seen being in real estate, but it's just the time. And who would ever think in the middle of a pandemic, we will have such a booming market in real estate in Minnesota County. And I mean, it's great. But at the same time, it's kind of disheartening because a lot of buyers are still looking for houses on the market. Hey, Sonny. Still looking for homes. Yes, hey, Sonny, it's, Tr it's Tracy. Can I, can I jump in for hey, just Tracy. a minute? Yeah. Okay, cool. So as, as Keith mentioned, um, you know, the buyers need to, obviously, you've got to come pre-qualified, like we said and, and uh, stressed so much earlier. Um, and when when Keith is talking about you need to save up as much as you can this this really over the last year and probably really over the last six months has has really hit home for us as agents we we were used to for home first time home buyers for sellers to almost readily pay a buyer's closing costs and your closing costs are going to run it's different for every buyer but could run up to you know three to four percent of the purchase price depending on the price point that you're in so, so you're right now on, on most homes in DeSoto County, if it's, let's just say 200,000 or, or less specifically, which is going to be that first time home buyer market. If you are ready to make an offer, Keith was exactly right. You've got to come kind of guns blazing. And, and what we mean by that is you need to go in with the most that you're absolutely willing to pay for that house in a multiple offer, because you are only going to have one shot at this. Okay. And your agent will explain that to you. Now, I, I just want to throw something out here. A lot of you who are first time home buyers, you're also um, relying on information and guidance from maybe some, some folks in your family, some from trusted mentors who have been around the block a few times and have bought some homes. They might, I just want to, say this, okay, carefully. Um, they may not have been in a market like we're in right now. And they may not have been in a position where they had, th that any house that they were gonna want to put an offer on, that they were gonna be big bidding against another buyer or 10 or 15 other buyers, which is happening. So when your agent is trying to guide you in this, understand that they're looking out for you and they really want the best for you. And that if they say, look, you go in with as high as you're willing to pay, knowing that you likely are, are going to have to pay your own closing costs. You may not have the opportunity to ask for a home warranty, or you may pay for the home warranty yourself. Know that that's the case if you want that house. I'm going to throw out just a couple of other things that can help give you an edge in a multiple offer. Um, and so discuss this with your agent, and uh, they, they will probably tell you these same things. One is know what is important to the seller, okay? If there are several, several offers that they're weighing um, and one of those allows them a little bit of extra time to get out of the house or maybe, maybe the seller hasn't found a house yet because they're in the same situation, inventory short. Ask your agent to ask their agent what's important to the seller. Are there things that I can do to sweeten the deal that might not just be about the money, might not just be about 
the price that I'm paying for the house or how much they're netting on the house, okay? It may be that they need more time to move. It may be that they need a flexible closing date because they've got to have time to find a house. It may be that they want somebody in that house that's going to love it as much as you have, as they have loved it and have, they, maybe they've grown their, their family in this house. And so maybe you write a, a heartwarming letter, okay, that this, you don't know what's going to kind of trip the trigger for a seller. So it's kind of like fishing, okay, those of you that fish, you kind of throw all the bait, as much bait out there as you can and hope that, you know, something, something's going to bite. And so it's the same thing with the seller. You, you, you do your reconnaissance work and find out what's, what's important to them and then try to structure your offer based upon that as well as go in with the best that you're willing to do on the price and with the least amount of concessions or the least amount of baggage. And again, this is if you're in a multiple offer situation, which likely, as Keith mentioned, he said it's tough out there. And uh, he's, he's right, it's tough out there but it's doable. So don't give up. Okay. Don't give up on this dream because it's doable for you. And you get, get a great agent like Keith, you get a great agent out there and find, find out what it is that you can do. What are the steps that you can take along with getting approved with that local lender? So I just I wanted to just let you know, you can do it. It may take you a few tries. You'll, you'll get it figured out though. And I like your point right there, Tracy, what's important to the seller? Because there are times where the seller is moving or maybe they're building a home and they may not be able to move as quickly as you mentioned. And so would it be maybe they could actually rent from the new owner, go ahead and, and, and purchase the home, but actually allow them to stay there until they're ready to move. Would that be an option? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Sorry, I was doing thumbs up, but I don't know if you can see everybody. So yeah, that's, I have, I have had some of my sellers that that's the reason that they chose a buyer is because the buyer was willing to close at a certain time, but allowing the seller to rent the house. I had actually three sellers at a, one time renting their own houses back until, until their house was finished. Yeah. So that's a real, I, I love that you brought that up simply because that's such a great question to ask what's important to the seller as well and, and hopefully make that work for both parties. So in regards to that, in, in, in regards to negotiating, and you mentioned home inspections and appraisals. So talk to us, Tracy, a little bit about home inspections and why that's so important. Okay, home inspections. <laughs> gotta do it, gotta do it, gotta do it, period. Um, yeah. Here's the thing. You may be willing to do a little bit of work on a house, and that's totally cool. Number one, it's got to be uh, small enough types of repairs that your lender is okay with it as well. So you know, I get a, we, and I know Keith does do, and any other agents that are on here, we get we get folks that are going, hey, you know, I want to fix her up, or I want to. That's that's great. That I, I I encourage people doing some work on their homes. It makes them feel feel good about it. Um, but there are repairs that can't, uh, that aren't, aren't going to be, uh, for that lack of a better term, financeable, you know, where, where, you know, if, if the roof, uh, is not in good shape, your lender is going to need the roof to be in good shape, or you're going to have to go with some sort of a home renovation loan, which is a whole different ball of wax. Okay. But with regard to home inspection, you're, first of all, let me say that this is an optional thing. It is not a part of your closing costs. This is something you're gonna pay the home inspector at the time of home inspection, okay? Depending on the size of the house, depending on the home inspector, I mean, this can run, and I'm just gonna ballpark it anywhere from 250 to 350, $400, okay? Money well worth, worth spending, okay? Because what you're gonna find out from that home inspection, what are the things that might be deal killers? Are there structural issues? Are there major component issues? Is, is, the, are, is the heat and air working correctly? Do you have a leak with the water heater? Are there any spots in the house that don't have enough insulation? You know, you, the home inspectors can, can shoot temperature gauges to determine a lot of these things. Things that we as agents and you as a, as a home buyer are not gonna necessarily be able to readily see as you walk through the house. There might be some glaring things that you can see, okay? 
but there's going to be a lot of stuff behind the surface or, or in the components, the, uh, uh, the electrical, the plumbing, uh, heat and air, you know, those types of things that you're not going to know about unless you have a home inspection. Now, again, you may be prepared to do some of those repairs yourself. And it, so it's more sometimes for peace of mind to know, okay, I knew that, that the house was a little bit older and I knew I might have to do a few things, but it's good to know that these are manageable things. And if they're not manageable things, then you can request the seller to make some repairs prior to closing. And then you'll start negotiations on those types of repairs. Or it could be something scary enough that you go, you know what, uh, Mr. Seller, bye-bye. Um, you know, this is not now a house that I'm interested in because there's too much here for us to deal with. Or even if you fixed it, Mr. Seller, I'm, I'm scared of the house. Let's, let's figure that out within the first couple of weeks of going under contract so that you know with peace of mind that we can move forward in this house. And it's even important on a new construction house. So if you're buying new construction, you need to have a home inspection as well because there are things that can be missed by the city inspectors or by the county inspectors. And while the builder will fix those within the first year, if you find them, Sometimes it can be a hassle to have them fixed and you've got a schedule to get them back in and that sort of thing. Or if you don't find these repairs on a new construction and then you go to sell the house three or five years from now, guess what? Your buyer is going to order a home inspection. It's going to get found then and guess who gets to pay for it? You do. Well, not me. You do. You get to pay for it. So again, home inspection, super worth the money. Absolutely. And want to be sure, especially if you're buying an older home, that everything has been updated. It's in within code. As Tra Tracy mentioned, just not, not only our new homes, but to the older homes, because oftentimes um, they may not be updated. So it's really important to know that all those things that she mentioned has been updated to the current standards being request required in, in that home as well. Hey, also, Sunny, and, and yeah. it'll, it'll also help you know the age of the systems. Because here's the thing, owning a home is not just about your monthly payment. Owning a home, <laughs> there, there are other costs involved there. And yeah. some of that is home maintenance and home repair. And so it will just help you to prepare. If you know that the roof is serviceable now or that the heat and air is serviceable now, but it might be getting towards the end of its age or the end of its life, you can start putting some money away so that you can make those repairs down the road. So a really good example, that would be, as you already mentioned, an HVAC or the roof or anything like that that might need that just regular maintenance based on time. Good information, Tracy. Thank you so much. And in closing, talk to us a little bit about uh, what someone should expect. And Brian, you may can speak to this as well at, at the closing table. Let me back up a little bit and touch on a couple of quick things. <clears throat> we threw the word closing costs a lot, but nobody really touched on what they were, and really that's probably my job to do. Um, closing costs can consist of, of so many different things, and there's a term you're going to hear called prepaid. So we call it closing costs and prepaids. Um, closing costs could be things like the, the lender's fee, um, and that's usually anywhere from zero to one percent. They call that the origination fee. Uh, the appraiser, um, he charges anywhere from typically four or five hundred dollars, um, the closing agency or closing attorney, you know, they're going to have a number of fees and they range five, six, seven hundred dollar range. Um, title insurance, owner's title insurance, uh, recording fees at the courthouse, those are all closing costs. Um, then you're going to pay your what we call prepaids, which is your first year's homeowner's insurance. Uh, um, you're going to have what's called an escrow account and the, the escrow is always the most confusing Thing to talk about. I always tell folks to picture it like a savings account that's being held by your mortgage lender um, and you're putting money into it every month and then when your insurance and your taxes come due next year they're paid out of your savings account or your escrow account. So all that's collected at closing. That's the closing cost people keep talking about. Um, I see a lot of advertisements on TV that say things like you know uh, no closing costs. Well I'm gonna be the first to tell you Somebody wants to get paid and do their job. The appraiser wants to get paid. The lender wants to get paid. The attorney wants to get paid. So there's closing costs in there. Um, whether or not the borrower is paying them or even the seller is paying them or and a lot of times the lender is paying them. 
Um, you can do what's called lender paid closing costs, where in that case, the lender raises their interest rate, but they cover your closing costs. So that's getting, now that what Tracy and, and Keith were touching on earlier, where the sellers are not as, uh, in a position where they have to pay closing costs anymore, and let's say the borrower doesn't qualify for one of Macy's programs, and let's say the buyer doesn't have money. Well, somebody's got to get it somewhere, and that's usually where the lender steps in, and the lender pays lender paid closing costs. So there's a there's a, a ton of different ways to skin the cat, depending on what you qualify for or what programs you know fit you. So that that's something that and that goes back to one thing I think Tracy may have mentioned earlier, um, the local lender. Guys, I, I deal with it every day where a borrower calls me and they've dealt with one of these online lenders or these guys you see on TV. And I'm not going to mention names because I don't want to get sued either. But um, I bet we get a ton each month of folks who started with these online lenders um, and they come local because they realize they can't deal with the online lenders. And a big thing is these sellers don't want you to be an online lender. They want a local lender. Um, I had an agent call me this past week who's, and I was, for about this, but their seller accepted an offer six thousand dollars less with one of my borrowers than an online lender's borrower, and I don't think I'm worth six thousand dollars. But this apparently the seller thought I was. So, that, so the idea of staying local—that's not just a cliche. It actually has value to it. So stay local. Um, I got off on a tangent, Sonny. What was your question for me? I'm sorry. That's okay. It's really important too because. And the reason I know that you're mentioning stay local is because the local people here know the market here and they know the other people that they're working with as well. So yes, it's a really important point to stay local. Yeah, absolutely. If at all possible. Yes. Hey, with regard uh, just to staying closing local, in general, what to, oh, go ahead, ma'am. I was just going to say with regard to staying local, one of the other things is, is the local lenders know the programs for Mississippi. Yes. Right. Some of these yes. online lenders don't know about the things that Mississippi Home Corp is doing, and they don't know how to how to work together with that and plug into that. So, so not only does it add value to your offer, and and Brian is exactly right, um, and Keith can talk to this as well. But as listing agents as well, if we have a seller who has multiple offers they are looking at who that lender is and can that lender get it to the closing table and get it to the closing table on time, which right now, oh Lord, that's uh, getting to the closing table on time is becoming more of a, more of a thing. Um, but the local lenders know how to work with Macy and the Mississippi Home Corp and some of those types of programs. And, and Real quick, one of the things I didn't hit on, and I know you're, you want to talk about closings here in a second, so you're, I'll let you jump good. into that in a second. You can run with regard, with regard to getting to the closing table, um, it used to be that we as agents could say, hey, you know, contract to close is typically about 30 days. Right now, that might not always be the case. Um, if you're working with a local lender, you have a better shot at that. <laughs> I will say that. Um, because they're not, uh, they, they typically, your local lenders will put their purchase business ahead of the refinance business. These big mega lenders that are out there, the online lenders, or even just the big lenders, that it's just all goes in a stack, okay? And whether it's a refinance or a purchase doesn't always matter to them. Brian, it matters to, and these other local lenders, it matters to, because guess who's going to be calling them? Keith's going to be calling them, or actually on my screen, Keith's over here. Keith's going to be calling them. I'm going to be calling them going, Brian, what's going on? You know, we need this to close. Okay. My buyer is sitting here on go. What's, what's up? So that's, that proves valuable to the sellers, proves valuable to you. So anyways, but when you're looking at a close date, it's, it's likely right now, probably going to be in the 30 to 45 day window. Okay. So just, just be prepared for that. Um, so if you're needing to start your, you might need to start your search a little earlier in the process. Say your lease is going to be up, you're, you're renting something now and your lease is going to be up at a certain date where before you might have said, okay, well, I can go out and in a couple of weeks, find the right house. And then in another 30 days, get closed. Might not be the case right now. You might need to start your search early because it's going to take a little longer to not only find the right property because there's not many out there, but to get under contract and then get it to the closing table might, might also take a little bit extra time. Are you finding that as well, Keith? Exactly. And I mean, uh, most of the lenders, uh, they try to do their best to get it out. But again, allow a few extra days in there for underwriting. 
because Unright been getting bagged up as well. So allow him a few extra days. And I mean, like you said, normally 30 days, we know him been closed, but now we're going out more like 35 to 40. So it's still not bad, considering that we're still in the middle of a pandemic and they're doing their best to get everything out. But just allow a few extra days just in case. Hey, with regard to the pandemic, I'm glad you brought that up. And Sonny, I'm just jumping right you in. Go right ahead. I, want to I want to tag team with what Keith just said. On the pandemic, um, that has actually heightened buyer activity. So where, where you might think, hey, I'm going to be one of the only ones out here searching right now because nobody else wants to get out. Ooh, not so much. Uh, buyers, buyers' needs have changed. And so buyers have started uh, coming out really in droves. The interest rates are, are certainly a, a big part of that. When you're searching for homes, um, just be very um, uh, cognizant of, of the pandemic as you're doing that, okay? Um, your agent will be very cognizant of that. Before where an entire family might get to go look at houses with, with the agent, that's not always the case right now. Some, some sellers are limiting showings to just two, two people, the, the agent and two other people. So like maybe a, a, you know, a, a husband, wife, mother, child, whatever. Um, kids sometimes are being excluded from showing specifically because, you know, kids, it's hard for them not to touch stuff, you know, I mean, and so, <laughs> um, so always be prepared with a mask, always take your own hand sanitizer. That stuff will be in houses a lot of times as well, hand sanitizer, but go prepared for yourself to not only protect yourself in this, in this process, but also your agent and also the, uh, the home sellers as well, because, um, Guys, guess what? You're being videoed a lot of the time. You know, there there are the ring doorbells, there are the cameras in the houses, and so they're they're seeing uh, the buyers in the home. So so just go in. That will also, if you're in a multiple offer and you were very follow their instructions very specifically, and maybe the other buyer didn't. Hey, you know, you never know what's gonna um, what's gonna tip somebody's uh, tip you over the edge there. So thank you, Tracy. I'm glad that you covered that point as well. Do we have any questions out there, Amanda? We don't, but I was going to add something, Sunny, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, one of the things we had on our agenda, and their site is down, but I think both referenced saving for your down payment and whatnot. Um, and a lot of people don't know that Mississippi passed a couple of years ago a first time home buyer savings account. Um, the governor signed it, it is statewide. And what it is, is every year an individual can put 2,500 or a couple can put $5,000 tax free in a savings account. Uh, you can do it at your local bank and you use that money to help purchase your home. So tax free completely and you can use that for your down payment for your closing costs and it doesn't have to be 25, you can go up to 2,500. Um, it is also something where if you have grandparents or parents who want to start a savings account for their kids or grandkids, they can do that. Um, it can only be pulled out by the first time home buyer, um, but it can be put in by any, anybody, family members, anything like that. Um, and so that is a great way to start a, a, a savings program for your house. As I said, it is tax-free. You can do it at your, your local bank and contribute to it every year. I'm gonna add That's the link, which it's not working right now, <laughs> but I've let them know it's not working, but I'm gonna add it in the chat option as well. Thank you, Mayna. Thank you for covering that as well. That's a really great program that's available to uh, first-time home buyers. So with that, just a little bit of a recap. Um, First and foremost, just be sure as you're getting ready to prepare and to purchase a home that you're aware of your credit and what that might look like. Um, be sure that you speak with all of these coaches that you have out there that's available to you, like your lender that can walk you through the process, um, your agent, as, as Keith and Tracy talked about, how important they are to you to, to walk you through that entire search. To the, to the closing and then be that hub for you as well. And then also with Macy, be sure to check out anything that they may have available through the Mississippi Home Corp and any of those different programs that might be available to you, especially as a first time home buyer.